Good morning, friends. Would you please stand as you're able for our scripture lesson this morning, coming from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As Parker mentioned, my name is Matt, and I have the joy and privilege of serving as the pastor here. And we've uh, this morning we're continuing our slow journey through Romans chapter eight. We started this a few years, a uh, few weeks back. Sorry, not years. A um, few weeks back, and we've been peeling away the layers to Paul's overall argument of the chapter, and that is that for followers of Jesus, for those who are Christians. We have in Jesus the most complete and total assurance of God's love and acceptance. That, as we will see, that there is nothing in all of creation, the whole cosmos, that can separate us from the love and joy and acceptance uh, that's ours in God. You see, every single person in this room this morning, whether you are a Christian or a non Christian, we're all searching for assurance. We're, we're searching for somebody to look us in the eyes and say, it's, You're okay. It, your situation is okay, it's going to work out, that, that you're loved and accepted and wanted and that you belong. All of us this morning are looking for assurance. And the argument of Romans chapter 8 is that there is no better place, there is no sure source of assurance for the Christian than an in being in Christ, than, than following Jesus. Not in our work relationships, not in our uh, careers, not in our uh, personal relationships or, or in our parenting and our kids. The most sure and steady place where we can get the, the sense that you're okay, that, that you're loved, that, that you're wanted, that you belong, is found in Jesus, in Jesus alone. And because Paul knows that the human heart is slow to catch on to this truth, that, that it's the tendency of every human heart to find the needle of despair in the, haste, in the haystack of assurance, like the same way that, that we overlook dozens of compliments that we, we might receive and fixate on the one negative comment from somebody online that we've never even met. Because Paul knows that it's so easy for our hearts to wander away and forget the assurance that's ours in Jesus, in Romans 8, Paul gives us argument after argument after argument about why we should be sure that Jesus loves us and accepts us, that that we are assured of our position in him. In fact, if if you look at how our passage began in verse 18, he says, I consider, the the Greek word is actually, I've reckoned, I've done the math, I've logic that out. uh, that I am fully confident that we can be assured of God's love for us. When we started our study in Romans 8, Paul began his, his overall argument by saying we can be assured of God's love because Jesus Christ has kept the law for us, something that we were unable to do for ourselves. Jesus kept the law in our place and has given us this perfect record of law keeping. Then, building on that argument, Paul says that we can be assured of God's love because the Holy Spirit, God himself, has moved into our lives and has given us a new power and a new process to change and live the lives that God uh, intends for us to live and the lives that deep down we want to live. And then last week, Parker uh, showed us another element of what the Spirit does in us to assure us of God's love, that the Spirit tells us that we're adopted children of God, that we're not just strangers uh, who who are just passing by God. We're not... uh, debtors enslaved to sin and death, but we've been set free in Christ and we're welcomed at the table to the family of God. And what Paul does this morning is he teases out a little bit more about how the Holy Spirit assures us of God's love and he applies it to a particular part of our, of our life, of our existence that 
if we're honest, gives us the most ammunition for us to doubt that God is really for us, that, that God truly loves and accepts us. And that's the topic, that's, that's the experience of suffering. It, it's the problem of pain that gives us the, the most doubt that God loves us and that he's for us. You see, it's easy to believe that God is for us when life is going well, when we get that raise at work, uh, when the report card looks good, when we get into that school that's our top choice that we applied to. It, it's a lot harder to believe that God is for you uh, when you lose your job. Or, or when that relationship that you, were ho- that you were hoping was going somewhere blows up and falls apart. Or when you're hoping uh, to, to have a family, but you're, being str- but you're struggling with infertility or miscarriage. Or, or when the diagnosis come and your physical or your mental health takes a turn for the worse. It's hard to believe in those moments when suffering comes that God is really for you, that, that, that he uh, is in your corner, that he says it's, it's okay and it's all going to work out. Suffering gives us the, 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 the biggest doubt in our minds about the assurance of God's love. And I love that scripture, when it talks about suffering, it, it doesn't push it off to the side. It doesn't minimize, doesn't ignore the problem of suffering, but it actually tackles it in such a way where in the gospel, in the Christian understanding of, uh, of religion and of following God, that we actually have resources to navigate our suffering and to carry it differently in a way that can actually transform suffering for our good. And so this morning, I want us to consider uh, the, the problem of suffering through the lens of, of how Paul responds to it, this idea of future glory, that in verse 18, he says, I consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is headed our way. And we're going to look at this idea of future glory through the lens of our suffering by considering our groanings. If you look back through this passage in Romans 8, you'll notice that there's a lot of groaning going on. There's groaning that's arising from three different sources, and so we're going to look at each of these specific areas of groaning and tell us how the prospect of future glory can inform our groanings and our sufferings in this present moment. You notice, first, uh, creation is groaning. Secondly, you'll see that we ourselves are groaning. And then last, you'll see that the Spirit is groaning. And so we'll work our way through these three different groans and see what they teach us about God and his grace. So first... Let's consider creation's groaning. And if you're following along, it's verses 19 to 22 in our text. And, and, and groaning is a fitting word, right? Like you just say the word groan and you know it's coming from a person who is suffering, who's exhausted, who's tired. The sound of a groan is pregnant with suffering. And in our text, the word for groaning that Paul uses is the word that's used in Greek literature to describe uh, the groaning of warriors on a battlefield. Uh, warriors who are, are in the, the throes and, and the pangs of death. They're on death's doorstep. And uh, I'm not sure if you watched the series Masters of the Air or not when it came out uh, a while back, uh, but the, the hardest part of that series for me to watch was not the, the battle scenes where the, the pilots were you know, dodging gunfire and trying to keep their planes in the sky. The hardest parts of that series for me to watch were after the battle was over as they're pulling the wounded off of the plane, and you hear the groaning and the crying. The adrenaline has wore off, and they're, and they're in the throes of death and intense pain. This is the kind of groaning that Paul is envisioning and, and importing into this language here as he talks about groaning. And when he says that creation is groaning, what Paul is trying to convey here is that creation is groaning because the world isn't as it should be. The world isn't as it should be. And the Bible talks about creation talking to us a lot. That if you go to the Psalms, for instance, you'll see in Psalm 19, we read that the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim his handiwork. You jump forward to Psalm 98, it says the rivers clap their hands, uh, and, the, and the hillsides, the mountains, sing for joy. And, and Jesus, uh, in, in his ministry, when he's making his entry into Jerusalem, and the people are crying out, Hosanna, uh, save us. And he's, and he's rebuked for it. He said, if, if these people weren't saying, the rocks would have spoken up and said this instead. Creation is talking to us. And so it's, it, when creation speaks out, it's important for us to listen. And, and when creation groans, it's telling us that the world isn't as it should be. That suffering in the cosmos is a bug and not a feature. It, it's, it's not natural to suffer. It's unnatural. It's not the way... It was meant to be. And this squares with what the Bible teaches about the world, that God created this world and it was good and suffering and death was not part of his original intent or plan, but through the rebellion uh, of his creation, through 
through our uh, decision to, to, to know better than God, to be our own savior, to be our own sovereign, we have broken the world and that has caused suffering and death to break in uninvited uh, into the cosmos. Our rebellion against God has broken everything and because the world isn't as it should be, it groans out in pain. But, Paul says, while creation does groan, and in verse 21 it says it's in bondage to decay, suffering is not the final note on the story of creation. Paul talks about this future glory that's going to come in and renew and transform the world and set it free from its bondage to sin and death and decay. And this is a, a unique understanding for the problem of suffering. Because if you take the Christian understanding that the world is good and broken and redeemed and not yet what it will be, it gives us a unique lens to, to view uh, the problem of pain that other worldviews, other religions, other ways of being in the world just can't provide or satisfy. For instance, if you take some of the Eastern faiths, think Buddhism. Buddhism will teach you that suffering is an illusion, that if you uh, are experiencing pain or suffering, it's because you're too attached to the world around you, that if you were just to take a step back and enter into this realm of enlightenment, you would see that all the world is one. And so why are you... Uh, why are you uh, feeling pain or why are you crying out if everything is just going to to revert back into oneness you yourself if if you're going to revert back into oneness why why cry out in pain now if that's the ultimate destiny of things or or consider karmic religions like hinduism that teach uh that all the suffering that you're experiencing in this life is just the product of decisions you made in a previous life so you shouldn't be uh you, you shouldn't be crying out and groaning in your suffering, saying it's unfair because in, in the karmic system, it's all deserved. Your suffering is proportionate to what you have done in a previous life. The, the, don't, don't complain about your suffering because in some uh, moral, uh, spiritual calculus, you've earned it. Or consider the Western view of suffering, which says suffering is meaningless. If our cosmos came into being from nothing and it's headed towards, uh, and it's headed towards nothing, and if our species evolved through a process of uh, a violent process of the strong eating the weak. Suffering is just a fact of life. Accept it, move on, carry on. If, if we're coming from nothing and heading towards nothing, that means we can't have meaning in our pain in the, in the present. So just accept your suffering and move on. But you see how the Christian response is different because unlike Buddhism, Christianity says suffering is real. Uh, our bodies uh, are, are good. The, 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 the created world we live in is good, but it's broken. And so our suffering is real. It's valid. Uh, against karmic religions, Christianity can say that because of the broken world we live in, suffering isn't always deserved. Suffering isn't always proportionate to uh, the actions and things that we've done. We, we live in a broken world and natural disasters happen. Cancer diagnoses come. Uh, pain that, that you weren't looking for or deserved finds you. Christianity says that the suffering is often unjust and undeserved. And then against Western materialism, suffering, uh, Christianity says that, that suffering does matter because our lives matter. We're, we're made for eternity, and, and our suffering in the present moment means something. We can find meaning in our suffering. And, and, and not only can we find meaning in our suffering, we can lament. We, we, can, we can mourn and rage against the pain and suffering we experience in life and say that this shouldn't be the way it, it, it happens. This, this shouldn't be the thing uh, that, that, that is happening and taking place in our lives. You see, Christianity alone arms you with a gritty realism about the world. It, it, and it's only when you can see things truly that you can begin to move forward with any sense of progress or hope. You see, creation's grown and confronts all of us in that it demands an explanation to the problem of suffering. You see, the problem of pain is not just a problem for, for religious people. It, it's a problem for people period, full stop. And so if you're here this morning and you've not considered the problem of pain because uh, religious explanations for it aren't satisfying to you, then what's your explanation for, for the problem of pain? Uh, how, how, how do you respond to the suffering in the world? And are you actually living out the logic of that view? If you have an explanation for suffering, but you're actually living as if your suffering matters, uh, it, 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 or, or if you're uh, your explanation for suffering is actually what's happening to you is unfair or unjust. Well, where did you get that notion of just and unjust? Is your explanation for suffering actually more, more Christian than you, than you realize on the surface? And if your explanation uh, for suffering finds you, finds you borrowing from, from Christianity's explanation about suffering, then, then could it also be possible that there's more to Christianity uh, than, than what meets the eye? that if you're borrowing a Christian view to help understand or, or, or make sense of some of your suffering, that there's more to the Christian faith 
as well. So creation's groaning challenges us to look at the problem of pain in our lives. Where did it come from? What's your explanation for it? How do we, how do we move in the midst of it? So if that's what creation's groaning is teaching us, let's shift the focus now to our groans, to our groaning. And you see this in, in Romans 8, verses 23 to 25, that if creation tells us that the world is not what it's supposed to be, our groanings teach us that we're not what we're supposed to be. Our groanings teach us that, that we're not what we will be. Verse 22 adds another layer of texture to our groanings by describing that our groanings, our pain and suffering, are like the pains of childbirth. The, the pains of new life breaking through into the world. In the following verse, verse 23, Paul says that we groan because we're awaiting the adoption uh, that's ours as, as children of God. And if you were here last week, as, as Parker was talking us through uh, that, the, the adoption that's ours in Jesus, uh, in, in the last section of Romans 8, Paul says we are adopted. This section says we're, we're awaiting our adoption. So, you know, which is it, Paul? Are you walking back what you just said? No, what, what Paul is saying is that we are already adopted, but we're not yet experiencing the fullness of that adoption. We're brought into God's family, but we're not yet experiencing the fullness of, of, of being in God's home, of being around God's table and, and, and perfect harmony and relationship with him. See, the groaning we experience is anticipatory pain. It, it, and recognizing our pain in this way can transform the way that we handle suffering. Uh, because think about it. There are, there are many different kinds of pain in the world, and, and each one has a message that it wants to communicate to us. Um, so an example of this is that you know, most afternoons these days for me is spent on the floor with, with my daughter, Emery. And uh, Emery loves to uh, you know, be tossed around on the couch and be wrestled with. And whenever I go to pick up Emery, from time to time, I will feel a small pain in my back. And that's my body telling me that if I keep trying to pick up Emery the way that I'm trying to pick her up, it's not going to go well for me. I'm going to slip a disc. I'm going to throw my back out. Uh, so this, this is a kind of pain that's a warning pain, right? The, the, it's, the, it's the warning pain that if you keep doing this, uh, it's not going to go well for you. There, there's not just the, a, a pain that warns. You, you can also think about a pain that builds. Uh, so for those of you who go to the gym, um, you, know, you can brag about it after the service. Uh, but what is, what is going to the gym? It's, it's going uh, to experience pain where you break down the muscle fibers of your body so that the muscles grow back stronger. You experience a pain, but it's a pain that, that builds. Uh, or think about this example, uh, not just a, a pain that warns or pain that builds, what about a pain that heals? Uh, this is the kind of pain that you would experience in the operating room, where a surgeon takes a scalpel and cuts your body open, and thankfully, due to modern medicine, we don't experience it uh, as, uh, as people in previous generations would, but it's, it's a pain that has cut you open not to, not to wound you, but to, but to mend you, but to make you whole. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a pain that ultimately brings healing. You see, the, the, the kinds of pain that we experience can uh, help us, teach us about, uh, about our lives and about the world around us. In fact, C.S. Lewis was fond uh, of saying in a book that he wrote called The Problem of Pain that God often whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts, he shouts at us in our pains, that pain is his megaphone to rouse a hurting and deaf world that he's here, that he's near. And if you were to look over the pages of scripture, and if someone were to ask you, where is the most likely place where you're going to, where, where you're going to meet with God, where, where you're going to find God? If you were to ask a person on the street, they might tell you that the most likely place you're going to meet God is if you go on a spiritual quest, you climb a mountain, you meet with a guru, with, with a guru and you ask him um, you know, some of the deep questions of life, or you, you might go and find God in a church that's clean and sterile and he seems far off, but if you look at the story of the Bible, what you'll learn there is that where you find God is in the moment of your suffering. You find God in the moment of your pain. Uh, that scripture says that God is near to the brokenhearted. He, he is near to those whose hands are drooping, whose knees are weak. That if you're going to find God, you find him in your pain. And, and God says that he is close to those who are, who are, who are hurting, to, close to those who are suffering. And, and it's in that moment of suffering that, 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 that Paul says we're reminded of our adoption as children of God. And, and consider adoption for a moment, that if in our pain, God relates to us as a father. If we're, if we're his adopted children, that means we relate to God as a father and not as like a boss in an employee relationship. And oftentimes in our spiritual life, we forget that our, that our relational dynamic with God is a father and, and, and child. And we relate to God like a boss 
and an employee. And when suffering comes, it not only becomes an argument uh, against our faith, it actually becomes a detriment to our own spiritual health. Uh, because when we view God as a boss, we think that God owes us a good life, that we're obeying God, we're, we're doing all the Christian things, um, we're you know, giving our money and our time away for, for good causes, we're, we're sharing our faith, and now God owes us a good life. Uh, you know, uh, I've done things for God, and now God needs to do things for me. But if you forget that our relationship with, with God is a parent-child and, instead of a boss-employee, it, it completely skews our, our picture of God and our, and, and our uh, view of what God is wanting to do in our lives. You see, if, if, if we view God really as Father, it transforms the way we experience pain. Now, for, for those in the room who have kids, uh, maybe you've responded to a crying child at night, and it doesn't matter uh, whether that child was good that day or bad that day, right? When, when your child is screaming at 2 in the morning, what do you do? You go. You run to them. You intervene, and you tell them it's going to be okay, and, and you assure them of your love, and you put them back down to bed. See, God does not run from you in your pain. He does, it, it's not a just deserts for how you've lived. Scripture teaches us that in our pain, God is nearer to us than perhaps in any other ex- ex- moment or experience in our lives. And, and it's not just understanding that God is running to us as a father in our pain, but keeping this parent-child relationship in, in mind is helpful because, again, parents often have a better perspective and wisdom and knowledge that the children in the moment just can't understand. So another example, even just from this morning, uh, as, as, a, as a parent, um, about a dozen times a day, I have to run after my daughter and uh, who, who has found herself in front of the dog's food and water dish and is either splashing around or grabbing the, the, the kibbles from the bowl and either throwing them around or trying to put them in her mouth. And I have to go over and, and, and knock the kibbles out of her hand and redirect her and push, put her into a different part of the house. And she cries in the moment because she's been denied something she wants. But then quickly she's redirected and she's off to the next thing as if nothing happened. You see, sometimes the, the, the suffering uh, and, and, the, and the things that are, that are happening in our lives, we just fail to understand from, from, a, fatherly, from, from a fatherly perspective why these things are, are in our lives. And that doesn't say that, that uh, and, I'm, and in making that statement, I'm not trying to make a generalization about your pain and suffering. I, I don't know the particulars uh, of the suffering that you might be experiencing in this moment, but... All I'm, all I'm trying to do in this moment is suggest that if, if, our, if our position before God is as a child, and a child doesn't know everything that, that, a, parent, uh, that a parent knows or, or that a parent does, could we just embrace a little bit of humility that while we don't understand why we're suffering the way we're suffering in this moment, that, that it's not because God doesn't care, that, that God is uh, powerless in the situation, uh, that God doesn't um, have this purpose uh, for, for our suffering in this moment, that, that we can, in, in childlike dependence on God, go to him in our pain, knowing that he's near, uh, and that while it's not quite perceptible to us in this moment, that he has a purpose for our suffering. Because Paul says that someday our suffering is going to give way to a future glory. And what that means for us is that our pain and suffering will not have the last word in our story. Pain and suffering will not be the final note on the symphony or the tapestry of your life. We will not say, like Macbeth, life is but a walking shadow, a poor, a poor player, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Rather, suffering means we're going to say with Paul that I am convinced that this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us a weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So suffering teaches us in creation that the world isn't as it should be, in us that, that we are not what we will be. And now let's consider finally the Spirit's groaning. The Spirit is also groaning. You see this in verses 26 and 27. And verse 26, we read that the Spirit groans, and it's the same word that's used uh, to describe creation's groaning and our groaning, the, the, the groaning of, uh, of a warrior dying in battle. But surely that can't be the kind of groaning that's describing the Spirit, right? The Spirit is God, so you know God is other than us, and so his suffering can't really correlate one-to-one with our suffering, can it? Well, if, if you're familiar with the story of the Bible, it, yes, that, that, is the, that is the kind of groaning that the Spirit experiences. That, that is the kind of groaning that God has experienced, because I, I, I think, and in, in, in for everything that I've said about the Christian view of suffering to really change and transform our, our, our suffering, our circumstances, 
we need a God that groans. We, we need a God that's familiar with suffering. And in Jesus Christ, that's exactly what we have. You see, Jesus Christ plunged himself into our sufferings so that he can bring us into his glory. In Mark chapter 7, when Jesus stopped to heal a person who was both mute and blind, we read that Jesus looked up to heaven and he sighed. And that word for sigh is, is the word of groaning. Jesus groans at the, broken, uh, the brokenness uh, of the world. And on the cross, Jesus shouts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22.1. And if you were to go to the Psalms and read that verse in its entirety, you would read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the, from the words of my groaning? See, Jesus describes his own life as groaning. Jesus came to this earth. God himself became vulnerable, and he plunged himself into our groaning and our suffering. And friends, it's only when you remember and look to that that, that you're saved because of Jesus and his sufferings that you're going to find a, a way to carry and navigate your suffering. If you feel like someone has let you down, uh, and, and you're about to get angry, you look at Jesus on the cross and realize that Jesus is on the cross because you let him down. And if Jesus was patient with you, then you could be patient with other people. Or it, it, if, if you um, look at Jesus' sufferings and, and you see that, uh, that you think that your suffering is unjust, that, that your suffering is undeserved, that it's something that, that you wish wouldn't have happened to you, you look at Jesus and see that there's only one truly innocent sufferer in all of human history, and it's Jesus, and he's bearing his, his suffering for you patiently, that, that you don't look at Jesus as just an example. You look to him as a savior and know that if Jesus bore unjust suffering in his body, that, that you know that, that, there, that there might be a purpose in, in your suffering, however uh, disproportionate and, un, and unjust it might be, that, that if you look at Jesus, how in the world could you fret that, that, that your suffering is, is so much smaller in degree to what he suffered on your behalf? Or lastly, if you're thinking that I don't, I don't care what you've said about pain and suffering uh, because I'm suffering right now and I don't see how any good is going to come out of this. I, I don't see how God is going to use my pain at all for some greater story or greater purpose. Well, friends, could you consider that that's the same thing that they probably said at the foot of the cross? That they look at Jesus, uh, a great teacher, uh, a great leader, someone who had power to feed thousands, who raised the dead, who healed the sick, who who taught with, with, with unparalleled authority, and they're staring uh, up at him, nailed to the tree, and they think, how could this have happened? We saw what Jesus did, and we saw what he, was, he said he was going to do, but, but here he is, dying the, the death of a common criminal. How could any good come out of this? And, and I imagine in that moment, many people lost their faith watching Jesus die in that tree. They, they walked away disheartened and discouraged, that there was no good that was going to come out of that suffering. Not realizing that that was the very moment in human history that God's goodness and mercy and justice and wisdom and beauty were on full display. See, if God can, can take the most pointless, the most painful, the, the most unjust suffering in all the world and turn it into something of immeasurable, incalculable glory, resurrection, everlasting life, personal salvation, global renewal, then we can look at the cross and say, I, although I don't know the suffering that I'm experiencing right now, what, what to make of it, what purpose it serves, I can look at Jesus and know that, that if his suffering turned into glory, because I'm in Christ, my suffering will turn into glory as well. That, that everything sad will come untrue because Jesus plunged himself into our groans so that we can enter into his glory. Friends, would you pray with me? Our Father, we ask you that you would help us to believe in Jesus, to see that we were saved through his patient suffering for us. And let that take away all of our anger, all our inability to trust, and let it make us a people that know how to suffer and, and make us a church where sufferers can come because they're treated so well, so lovingly, with so much support. Make us a community where it's a great place to suffer and make us a community of people who show the world that through our suffering, your son Jesus, who is the light and hope of the world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.